Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Brina and today is Saturday. So that means it is another episode of Didn't Make Up the Mystery. And if you're wondering what that means, well, it is my series where I put my makeup on and talk about anything from murder to conspiracy theories. Although we haven't quite gotten to the conspiracy theories yet, but it is coming. I did not have an episode last week. The last new episode I had was the can't think of his name. I will put a card up here if you want to check it out, but it was a New Year's episode. I really can't think of the guy's name. One, one second. Hold on. It was about the 1998 New Year's disappearance of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope, and it's a very interesting story, so definitely check it out if you're interested in that. So like I said, I did not have an episode last week. I had a really great episode planned, and I had a really great look to go with it, but then I was like, oh crap, I don't really have the stuff I need to do this look. So I pushed it back and I ordered the stuff. It is supposed to come in today. I haven't received it yet, but fingers crossed that it did. And I'm going to be doing that look for you guys next week. I am very excited for it, but to hold us over until then, today we're going to be talking about Dr. Death. So Dr. Death is a man named Christopher Daniel Dunst. He was born on April 3rd, 1971 in Montana, but he spent most of his younger years in Memphis, Tennessee. He went to Evangelical Christian School in Cordova, and he dreamed of playing college football at either Colorado State or Colorado University. But let's be honest, he really wasn't, like, he wasn't a talented athlete. He wasn't, like, he wasn't gifted in that area. You know what I mean? Most kids that go on to play college football, especially at a university, are very talented and it just comes naturally to them. That's the word I was looking for. It didn't come naturally to him. Chris really, really had to try at pretty much everything he did. He put in a lot of extra hours in the weight room and eventually he did get a college football scholarship, but it was to Millsaps College in Mississippi. So not really what he had dreamed of achieving for himself. He went to Millsaps, but like I said, that was not his dream. And his whole entire freshman year, he longed of transferring to a Division I school. So he set his sights on the Colorado State Rams. And after a lot of hard work, his sophomore year, he made it as a walk-on at Colorado State. But after he started playing for the Rams, it became very, very clear that he really just did not have what it took to be a pro or even a college athlete. He really struggled with remembering the plays, but bless his heart, he would go over the plays over and over and over again until he could get them down. Like I said, football just did not come naturally to him. He really had to work at it, but I believe his dad played college football and so so that just became his dream as well, and he was determined to make it work. But after spending his sophomore year in Colorado, he became homesick, and he ended up transferring schools yet again. This time he went to Memphis State University, which is now the University of Memphis. He hoped to once again play football, but he learned that due to his numerous transfers, he was no longer eligible to play. So Chris made a new dream for himself. He decided he was going to be a doctor, but not just any doctor. No, no, no. That wasn't gonna be good enough for Chris. He was gonna become a neurosurgeon. Specifically, he wanted to operate on injured backs and necks. By 1995, Chris had earned his undergraduate degree and he enrolled at the University of Tempus <laughs> the University of Tennessee at Memphis College of Medicine. He was very eager to earn his MD and PhD. And then while he was doing his residency, he teamed up with two Russian scientists who were recruited by the University of Tennessee to explore the commercial potential of stem cells to revitalize ailing backs. So basically what they wanted to do was figure out a way that they could use stem cells to help fix people's backs. They successfully patented the technology needed to obtain and grow disc stem cells. Jeez, I can't, I'm having a really hard time talking. And in 2008, they launched a company called Discgenics. They were going to use this company to develop and sell their products. 
and it appeared that it, during this time Chris was just really thriving in his life. From the outside it looked like everything was going right. He was on the track to becoming a neurosurgeon. Here he is starting this new company but little did people around him know. I mean his friends his close friends knew because they were engaging in this, but little did his colleagues know, Chris had a bit of a drug problem. About halfway through his residency, there was a party for Chris's birthday, and they drank an excessive amount of alcohol, they used cocaine, pop pills, and then at dawn, Chris threw on his white lab coat and headed off to do rounds. That is definitely not the type of, especially a neurosurgeon that I would want. I mean, I wouldn't want my doctor to to be partying all night and then taking care of me like my general physician definitely would not want my neurosurgeon to be doing that this is not looking good for Chris's future. So when Discgenics was first launched, a guy named Rand Page decided he wanted to invest in the company. It sounds like a really great company. It actually is still around today, though Chris has nothing to do with it, but he would later say that he was initially very impressed by Chris, as was pretty much everything around him. From what I got, Chris is definitely a narcissist. He definitely knows how to put on a front. He knows the right thing things to say, the right way to act, just to make people feel comfortable around him. But as time passed, Rand became very suspicious and wary of his new business partner, aka Chris. They would have early morning meetings where Chris would be mixing up some vodka and orange juice. And on one occasion, he went over to Chris's house to pick up some paperwork and he opened up a drawer on Chris's desk. And and he found a mirror with some white powdery substance on it as well as a rolled up dollar bill. So I think we can all guess what Chris was doing in his free time. Like I said, he was doing cocaine, popping pills, he was drinking all the time. He just really wanted to party. So as it turns out, Chris actually had ulterior motives when he started dysgenics. He really did not want to be a neurosurgeon. Like he wanted the prestige of being a doctor. He wanted to become a doctor, get his MD, his PhD, all that stuff, but he didn't want to actually have to do the work. So he started dysgenics thinking this would be a great way for for him to make the big bucks and not have to put in a whole lot of real work. So when he got forced out of this Gen X, you can only imagine that probably wasn't what he wanted. <laughs> and I think we can all kind of figure out why he was forced out. If one of the investors was well aware of his drug use and his day drinking, then I'm sure that's why he was forced out. His partners and investors ended up suing him over money and stock. So keep in mind that he started Dysgenix while he was doing his residency. So a guy named Dr. Frederick Boop was the chief of neurosurgery at the hospital that Chris was doing his residency at. And he never said outright that he knew about Chris's problems, but it appears that he did in fact know, or that the hospital at least had some sort of an inclination as to what Christopher was partaking in outside of work. In 2012, a Texas doctor contacted Dr. Boop in regards to Christopher, and Boop acknowledged that a woman had filed an anonymous complaint against Christopher, saying that he was in fact fact using drugs before seeing his patients. So I don't understand why alarm bells weren't sounded. He was doing his residency. I think they definitely should have, but I also kind of think that probably the college just did not want to be held responsible and, you know, hospitals do not like the blame to be on them. They definitely want to deflect and make it somebody else's problem. And it actually turns out that at one point the university had asked Chris to take a drug test due to this complaint about him doing drugs 
drugs before seeing patients, but he was able to avoid the test for several days. He just straight up disappeared on them. And when he returned from this little magic act where he disappeared, he was sent to a program for impaired physicians where he was closely monitored for the remainder of his surgical training. But it is unclear how much training Chris actually received because he was not a good surgeon, to say the least. But we'll get into that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Fresh out of medical school, Chris moved to Texas and he got a job working at Baylor Plano in Plano, Texas. Several of his operations there ended with his patients severely maimed. In one instance, Chris did an operation on a patient named Kelly Martin, where he ended up severing a major artery in her spine, which caused her to bleed to death. Soon after this operation, he was forced to give his resi resignation at Baylor. This is where the hospital was really working to save themselves and they weren't worrying about any future patients because by allowing him to resign instead of firing him, they did not have to report him to any greater beings that would then let other hospitals know not to hire him or that would result in anything where he would become under suspicion, which would then result in his license being suspended. So since Chris was allowed to just quit, he was just allowed to get another job and continue practicing medicine. After he quit his job at Baylor Plano, he went on to work for Dallas Medical Center in Farmers Branch, Texas. But this job only lasted less than a week due to Chris's incompetence. He performed two operations while working there. At least that I'm aware of. That might not be fully true, but I don't think any of his operations went off without a hitch, so I probably would have found out about them. But first he operated on a lady named Floella Brown. After her operation, she woke up and everything seemed fine, but then early the next morning she lost consciousness and she had swelling on her brain. Nobody could figure out what was causing the swelling or what was really wrong with her. They really were clueless as to why she fell unconscious and why she wasn't waking up. So when Chris arrived that day for his next surgery, he was informed about Floella's state and he just went ahead and scrubbed into his next surgery, went about his business, didn't tell anybody anything that could be causing this. He just seemed as shocked and clueless as everyone else. So like I said, they were getting ready for the next surgery, which was on a lady named Mary Eford. I don't know how to say her last name for sure, but while they were getting ready to go into surgery, the nurse noticed there was a hole in Chris's scrubs, specifically a hole on his butt, and it was very noticeable because Chris did not like to wear underwear apparently. And then that's when the nurse realized that he had seen this hole before, particularly for the last three days, because Chris had been wearing the same scrubs for three days straight. Now, I mean, the man's fresh out of medical school. Maybe he just only owns one pair of scrubs, but I don't think that's the case here. He then starts to notice that Chris's pupils are like pinpoints and the man hardly ever blinks. So it's not taking long for this nurse to start putting the pieces together here. But regardless, they go on with Mary's surgery. And during the surgery, Chris tells the nurse to inform the front desk that he's going to be performing a craniotomy on Floella later to help relieve the pressure to her brain. But the nurse starts arguing with Chris because he doesn't think this is a very good idea. First of all, this particular hospital doesn't even have the proper equipment to do a craniotomy. Second of all, they don't know what's exactly causing Floella's swelling in her brain. And third of all, Chris performed the last surgery that led her to the ICU. So maybe we ought to let somebody else take a look at her this time. But they continued to argue about this. Chris argued with his superiors about this. And keep in mind, this is all happening during Mary surgery. So while all this arguing is going on, the operating room staff is questioning, wondering whether Chris is putting hardware into Mary in the correct places because he is constantly 
drilling and re-drilling holes and removing screws. This, it's just not looking very good for Mary. Honestly, if I was a supervisor in this position, I don't think I would just stand idly by. I think I would probably intervene and double check his work because, I mean, if the dude's already arguing with everybody, his mind's clearly not where it should be. And then the fact that he's drilling, re-drilling, removing screws, putting screws in, I think I would have probably intervened at this point. I mean, you are his supervisor for a reason. And as it turns out, Chris ended up severing Mary's nerve roots during her spinal fusion surgery, and he left surgical hardware in her back muscles. So longtime spine surgeon Robert Henderson swooped in to perform a salvage surgery on Mary, and he he compared Chris's work to that of a child playing with tinker toys. Mary was left paralyzed as a result of Chris's shoddy work, but I have a feeling Dr. Henderson probably saved her life. And in the end, the craniotomy on Fluella did not happen, thankfully, but sadly she ended up being moved to another hospital where she never regained consciousness and a few days after the surgery her family chose to remove her from life support. The neurosurgeon who reviewed her case determined Chris had both pierced and blocked her vertebral vertebral artery with a misplaced screw. The review also found that Chris had mis misdiagnosed her source of pain and he was actually operating in the wrong place. By the end of the week, hospital administrators told Chris he would no longer be operating at Dallas Medical Center. But Chris was once again allowed to resign. Once again, keeping any reportings of his horrific work from going to the proper places. Once again, a allowing him to go off, get another job, and continue operating. But he was finally reported to the state medical board for the botched surgeries on Floella and Mary. And Dr. Robert Henderson, the guy who had to fix Mary, made it his personal mission to stop Chris from operating further. But in the meantime, Chris went on and got another job, this time at Legacy Surgery Center, where he was allowed to continue operating. He did a surgery on a patient where he ended up cutting her vocal cords and one of her major arteries. Finally, on January 15th, 2013, Chris was reported to the National Practitioner Data, Data Bank, which is a confidential information clearinghouse created by Congress to improve healthcare quality, protect the public, and reduce healthcare fraud. So if Chris would have been fired from his previous two jobs, they would have had to report him to the NPDA. But since they allowed him to resign, they were not obligated to report him. But this reporting still was not enough to stop Chris from getting another job. He got hired at University General, where he operated on a man named Jeff Glidewell. Chris ended up mistaking part of the neck muscle for a tumor and severed one of Jeff's vocal cords. He also cut a hole in his esophagus, sliced an artery, and left a surgical sponge embedded in Jeff's throat. Honestly, it is shocking and appalling that Chris was able to perform as many surgeries as he did, because how was nobody, like, like checking up on him. All of these patients are dying. Nobody's reporting this. Nobody's noticing that it's the same doctor who keeps killing these patients or maiming them. Like, how has nobody noticed? I just don't understand. Dr. Randall Kirby rushed in to fix Chris's screw-ups, and he later described what he found after opening Jeff back up as the work of a crazed maniac. He later told Jeff that it was clear Chris had tried to kill him. As a result of Chris's shoddy surgery, Jeff was left with only one vocal cord and partially paralyzed on his left side. Then on June 26, 2013, the Texas Medical Board suspended Chris's license and officially revoked it on December 6. Honestly, it's about time. The dude's only been out of college for like less than two years at this point. Whoever trained him, whoever signed off on him graduating, they should also be held responsible in my opinion because if it wasn't for them, Chris would have never been able to go on and operate. 
That's just the way I think. So, but what do I know? After all that happened, Chris decided to move to the Denver area and he ended up getting arrested for a DUI in Denver. Then on one of his visits to Dallas to see his children, he was taken for a psychiatric evaluation and was arrested again, and this time in Dallas for shoplifting. And by March of 2014, three of his former patients had filed a separate lawsuit against Baylor Planner alleging that that the hospital allowed Chris to perform surgeries despite knowing that he was a dangerous physician. Doctors Henderson and Kirby feared that Chris would just move somewhere else and he would obtain a new medical license and continue operating. They were convinced that he was a danger to the public, so they urged the Dallas County DA's office to pursue criminal charges against him. How long have I had lipstick on my teeth? That's attractive. So finally in 2015, the statute of limitations was running out on any potential charges that they would be able to bring against Chris. Part of the problem was being able to prove that his actions were willful and intentional as defined by Texas state law. Finally, after interviewing dozens of Chris's patients and their survivors, prosecutors determined that Chris's actions were indeed criminal and that nothing short of imprisonment would stop him from operating again. The Dallas DA's office subpoenaed every hospital on Chris's CV for records of his surgeries, including those that he did during his residency and one-year fellowship. According to the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, a neurosurgery resident does about 1,000 operations during training. According to the records gathered by the DA, by the time Christopher had finished his residency and fellowship, he had done less than 100 operations. So I really don't understand how he was able to get his degree. They were also able to get a hold of an email from December 2011 where Chris had emailed a colleague saying, quote, I'm ready to leave the love and kindness and goodness and patience that I mix with everything else that I am and become a cold-blooded killer. So this was before any of his patients had died. So I don't doubt for a second that Chris had gone into these surgeries knowing full well that he really didn't know what he was doing and he was okay with his patients dying as a result of his agenda? I don't know. In July of 2015, Chris was arrested in Dallas and charged with six felony counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, his hands and surgical tools, five counts of aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury, and one count of injury to a child, elderly, or disabled person. These indictments were handed up just four months before the statute of limitations was set to run out, and prosecutors sought a sentence long enough to ensure that Chris would never be able to practice medicine again. Over objections from Chris's lawyers, prosecutors called many of his patients to the stand in order to prove his actions were intentional. But according to Chris's lawyers, he only realized how bad of a job he had done as a surgeon when prosecution experts told the jury about his many blunders on the operating table. So he's saying, in my mind, I was the best surgeon ever. I don't know why my patients were dying. It must have been a freak accident. It had nothing to do with the surgery they received from me and he thinks he did nothing wrong. I think Chris very much knew he should not have been a surgeon. I think he was flying by the seat of his pants and I don't believe anything he says. The defense blamed Chris's actions on poor training and control by the hospitals. Absolutely, I think they play a hand in this too. If he had better training and if the hospitals had intervened sooner, I don't think this would have turned out near as badly as it did. After a 13-day trial, the jury needed only four hours to convict Chris for the maiming of Mary Efford. And on February 20th, 2017, he was sentenced to life in prison, which he absolutely deserves. And like I said, I think the people who allowed him to become a doctor should be held responsible. The college he attended should be held responsible. I think a lot more people than Chris here should be held responsible, but I don't really think that's going to happen. And that is the terrifying story of Dr. Death. What do you guys think about 
this? Do you think that the hospital should have intervened sooner? Do you think that he probably should have never gotten his medical license to begin with? Let me know in the comments. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Let me know who else you would like to hear me talk about or any conspiracy theories you'd like to hear me talk about. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye!